Okay, so I'm your last speaker for the day, and I won't keep you too long, and then you can all go off and have a nice drink and a bite to eat. Uh, so just to introduce myself, my name's Mark Scott. Uh, I've got my Twitter handle and my long-neglected blog, which I never write on anymore up there, and my GitHub um, username up there as well. Uh, so who am I? Well, uh, I'm a teacher. Well, fundamentally, I'm a teacher. I have been for 15 years. I started off teaching physics and chemistry. I was really happy doing that, and then, because I like a challenge in my life, I decided to switch over to teaching ICT. I didn't really like that very much. And because I like an even bigger challenge in my life, I then switched over to teaching computer science and electrical engineering. Um, and they were all good, and they were all great, and I loved that. But a couple of years ago, the Raspberry Pi Foundation look, were looking for somebody to come onto the education team and to help work with the education team to produce educational content, to produce educational resources. And so that's what I do uh, now. And what I'd like to talk to you about today is a little bit about the Raspberry Pi. But I'm not going to spend very long talking about the device. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the Raspberry Pi Foundation um, and what we do at the Foundation. I would love to talk to you about how we use GitHub as our platform for delivering open educational resources. And then I'm going to be really cheeky, and I'm going to sort of turn it over to you a little bit and ask you to help me out and ask you to help the Foundation out and ask you to help children all over the world that want to learn about computing. Um, so I'm going to do a quick little poll, first of all. Has anyone, well, hands up if you've heard the term digital making. OK, then. So not many people have heard the term digital making. We use that as a foundation, as part of our core aim, to put the, uh, digital making into the hands of children all over the world. And what I mean by digital making is if you make something with technology. Now, that could be quite a lot of things. So if you write code to make something, anything, you're a digital maker in our eyes. If you design websites, you're a digital maker. If you make movies and you do video editing, you're a digital maker. If you put together electronic components and build circuits and that kind of stuff, you're a digital maker. So now can I have a quick show of hands? How many people in this room would classify themselves by my definition of digital maker? Then just put your hand up if you think good. Almost everyone. That's absolutely lovely. Um, so another quick uh, question I'd like to ask you is, uh, how many people know how to code? Put your hand up, or consider yourself a developer or a software engineer. Keep your hands up for me, please. So you all know how to code. Keep your hand up if it was a teacher or a lesson at school that inspired you to come and do that for a living. Keep your hands up. So that is about a dozen people in this room were inspired to go into the profession that they now do and they love by a teacher. And that's not very many. That's an appalling number, in fact. If I was at a maths conference, or a science conference, or a history conference, or anything like that, and I said, hands up, who's a professional historian? A bunch of people put their hands up. And how many were inspired to do that by school and teaching and their teachers and education? Most would probably keep their hand up, because it's not the kind of thing you stumble into. But by the looks of it, most of you have stumbled into it. I don't know. Maybe you had a computer at home when you were a kid, and you were interested in it and that got you into computing, and you went and self-taught how to learn pro programming, or you had a really enthusiastic parent or mentor or older brother or something like that. And this is a big problem. What we know is we know that kids love to code. Okay? I've got some anecdotal evidence for this, and I've got some statistics for it as well. But I know if I put a kid down in front of a Raspberry Pi at a workshop or at an event I'm at or something like that, the first thing they'll do is they'll go and run and open up Scratch. No, the second thing they'll do is run and open up Scratch. The first thing they'll do is open up Minecraft. Uh, they'll play Minecraft a little bit, get disappointed by the fact that there's no animals or creatures in it, and there's no redstone. Close it down, then they'll open up Scratch. And once Scratch is open, they'll start expressing their creativity. They'll start experimenting with blocks and throwing things around. If you haven't used Scratch before, I recommend, even as like professional developers, you go and check out Scratch, because it's a lovely tool to show to kids maybe your kids one day when you have kids. Um, so they'll use Scratch in a really, really creative way and express their creativity. So we can, I can do that with any seven, eight, nine-year-old. Okay? Most of them will have used Scratch at school. All right? Most of them will come to the workshop and they'll want to play with that, with that coding environment. But then something must happen later on in life for the fact that those kids don't maintain that, that desire to keep coding. I've got some statistics here. This is from a Nesta report that was commissioned a couple of years ago. 
Um, and this is what children associate with the terms digital making. Once digital making has been described to them, like 90% of children associate uh, positive words with digital making. Okay, they think it's creative, they think it's fun, they think it's exciting. All right? <coughs> um, but there's this, a bit of a disparity between uh, 8 and 11 year olds, 51% think it's fun, and you get to 16, 18 year olds, and that drops down. That's 33% that think it's fun. Um, some do think it's boring, okay? Some do think it's nerdy or geeky, all right? Now, they might be using nerdy or geeky in a positive way, like we tend to, but they might be using it in a negative way as well. Um, so, kids like code, kids like digital making, they like being creative and they like expressing themselves with computers. Um, so, the kids aren't the problem, and we also know that the parents aren't the problem as well. In the same survey, talking to parents, 89% thought coding and digital making is a worthwhile activity. 99% of parents think it's important for their kids to be doing it in school. That's a lot of support from parents that we've got there. Uh, this one's interesting. Only 12% of parents were able to direct their children to somewhere where they could go and learn to code, or they could learn to do digital making. So there's a problem there in that these kids are wanting to do it, their parents want them to do it, but there's a disconnect. They don't know where to go and find the resources. So we know parents aren't particularly a problem either. And then we come to the problem with teachers. Now, this isn't a fault of the teachers. I'll say this really clearly now, because I am a former teacher, and because I know I've got some teachers in the audience, and I don't want to be lynched after I've talked. OK, so this isn't a problem with teachers. All right? It's not their fault. But statistically, looking at it, we've got 50% of teachers don't feel confident Okay, that's 50% of teachers don't really feel confident about teaching these digital skills to the children in their classroom. All right? And we've got 70% of secondary school teachers who are teaching computer science. 70% don't feel confident teaching computer science. 53% of primary school teachers don't feel confident teaching computer science. And that's a little bit worrying given that since a couple of years ago, that's come onto the national curriculum now. And every child from primary school up to the age of 16 is supposed to be doing some coding in their uh, weekly school life. The reason they don't feel confident is because of the sudden change that happened in the curriculum. We started off okay, with a lot of teachers that were very comfortable teaching ICT. They were very good at teaching PowerPoint and Word and Excel and these kind of stuff because they were tools that they used in their professional life anyway. And then suddenly it all changed, and they had to start teaching computer science in their classrooms, and all of a sudden that confidence dropped. There's no choice. They've got that. That's what they do for a living. They're computer science teachers now. Uh, but we've got 20% of secondary school teachers who are now teaching computer science. Well, this was in 2015. 20% of secondary school teachers teaching computer science, and 11% of the primary school teachers don't have a computing qualification. Okay. So they've never done it at university. They probably haven't done it. In fact, I know they wouldn't have done it at A-level or at GCSE because those qualifications didn't even exist back then. So we've got this interesting decline going on here. And lots of kids want to do it. Lots of parents want them to do it. Teachers would be happy to enable their kids to learn computer science if they had the skills to do it. <coughs> so that's where the Raspberry Pi came in because in 2009, um, Eben Upton, working at Cambridge University, along with a couple of other people, so Rob Mullins, Jack Lang, Alan Minecraft, Peter Lomas, and David Braben. These guys all worked at Cambridge University, and they recognized that the quality of the graduates that were coming through, the undergraduates that were coming through, was in steep decline. Uh, they weren't as good. They didn't have the skills that they used to have a few years before. And they wondered why, and they thought about this, and they came to the decision that it was probably... Well, they thought it was down to the device, OK? All of them had learned how to code on BBC Micros. Hands up if you had a BBC Micro when you were growing up. Um, obviously, you're going to be over 40 like me. Um, or uh, ZX Spectrum. A few of you, OK. So those computers were readily available and relatively inexpensive back in the 80s. And that's what a lot of these kids learned to code on. And jump forward a few years, and if you've even got a PC in your home, okay, the chances are your parents don't want you to touch it. It'll be running Microsoft Windows, okay? so it's not exactly the most hackable machine on the planet. All right? probably, your parents have probably locked it down so you've got no admin rights on it. Even worse, you could be sitting there on an Android device or an iPhone, which you can't code on at all, really. 
Okay? So these kids weren't getting the opportunity to develop those skills, to experiment, to learn. And so they came up with the idea of the Raspberry Pi. Um, and the Raspberry Pi was going to be this very cheap, very easy to use, child-friendly device that kids could learn to code on. And that was the original idea. And it sort of took off massively. It took off specifically in the maker and hacker communities, but a lot of kids were getting these devices as well. So at $35, the Raspberry Pi is a brilliant machine that you can give to kids, and they can play around with it, they can experiment it. If they break the OS, it's not a big deal. You just re-image your SD card, put it back in, and you're absolutely fine. If you break the device, it's $35 over a thousand pound laptop like the one I've got here, which I customarily break all the time, by the way, which is why I haven't covered it mine in stickers, because every laptop I get, I break, and then the most heartbreaking thing to me is losing my stickers. I now give them to my son, because he looks after his laptop a lot better than me. Um, so the Raspberry Pi was that, that first computer that we developed. The uh, Raspberry Pi um, trading since developed others. So we've got the Zero, okay, which is a $5 computer which we gave away on the front of a magazine. And again, the idea behind that was, okay, $35 is fairly cheap, but wouldn't it be even better if we could produce an even cheaper computer to give to kids? And they could really play around with it and break it and mess around with it and do what they liked with it. Uh, we produced a few other bits of hardware as well. So the sense hat was something that was developed because we're really into physical computing at the foundation. We recognized that back when I was growing up, when I was a kid, I thought it was really cool if I could print out my name in, um, and use a go-to to repeatedly print my name out on a screen and have it shift between 8-bit colors. And that was really cool to me. Changing pixels on a screen was awesome. If I show my son that now, my nine-year-old son, Oh, look, you can change pixels on a screen. He's just like, so what? Okay, that, that's not interesting to me. All of a sudden, if those pixels are little LEDs, then all of a sudden it's exciting. So we're really encouraged by physical making at the foundation. We love kids to play around with hardware and to make things move and blink and spin and, and explode. Uh, we also produce a camera so that we can, um, so kids can do some uh, photography work. And the other thing that Raspberry Pi Trading does is we try and engage our community with this thing called the Magpie, which is our magazine. Frequently do giveaways on it, so we had the Pi Zero given away, and the last issue had a really cool little Google project, a Google artificial intelligence project, so you could basically have a cardboard Google Home um, that you can make with your Raspberry Pi. And that's about all I want to talk about Raspberry Pi Trading and the hardware and, and, and that kind of stuff for now. What I'd really like to talk about well, if you are interested, you can go and check out the Linux kernel and that kind of stuff on GitHub. We've got two repositories for that, um, the UI and stuff like that. What I'd really like to talk about is the Raspberry Pi Foundation. So were you all aware that the Raspberry Pi Foundation is a charity? Yes? Yeah, hopefully. If we've been doing our publicity, right, you should know that we're an educational charity and that we were founded in 2009, way before the original prototypes for the Raspberry Pi came out. Um, our goal is to put the power of digital making into the hands of people all over the world, and one way in which we do this is by producing a low-cost computer. Okay, that's just one way in which we do that. As of March, we've sold 12.5 million devices, so we're the biggest selling computer the UK has ever had. All right. Um, and that obviously generates quite a bit of revenue. 12.5 million computers, if discounting a few Pi Zero sales, $35 a computer, okay, that's several million pounds and dollars that have come into the foundation's uh, bank account. So what do we do with that money? Okay. Well, primarily, we're an uh, organization that's about the people. Okay? So most of the money goes towards funding the staff. And so here's a small selection of our staff up there. Um, and uh, all, the, all the people that we employ they then further the foundation's missions. And we do that in lots and lots of different ways. So one way in which the foundation does that is by producing educational resources. All right, so this is one that I produced a few weeks ago now. It's called Getting Started with Git. I wish I'd named it something different, because it turns out when you Google Getting Started with Git, I'm probably about the 2,000th ranking now in the, in the results. Um, but we make educational resources so on our website, on raspberrypi.org slash learning, we have lots and lots of educational resources that you could give to children so that they could learn all about sometimes the Raspberry Pi. This one happened to be a cross-platform resource, so they could do it on Mac, Windows, or on Linux if they wanted. Um, 
And that's what I spend the vast majority of my time doing. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the process for our resource generation in a minute. Uh, the other thing we do is teach training. So I train teachers, and um, along with the rest of my education team, we run something called Pi Academy. Hands up if you're a teacher. I know there's a few in the room. Is there a few teachers in the room? Have you heard of Pi Academy? If you haven't heard of Pi Academy, go onto the Raspberry Pi website and check it out. Pi Academy is our face-to-face -face teacher training. So it's a two-day training course that we run, and the idea is to try and upskill teachers that don't feel particularly confident about digital making, or teachers that do feel really confident about digital making, to try and give them some extra skills, specifically about using the Raspberry Pi and electronics and that kind of stuff. So we do teach training, and we've also got some online teach training that we're running now on um, Open University's FutureLearn platform. And again, that's completely free. It's not just for teachers, okay? We're promoting it for teachers, but there's no way for us to say, you're not a teacher, you can't do the course. So anyone can go sign up for our FutureLearn courses as well. We do a lot of outreach work. So we go around uh, the country, we go to workshops, we go to like Camp Bestival, I think this one was taken at. Um, we go to these things and we try and introduce children to digital making at these events and give them their first experience of coding or give them a little bit of advice at coding and to show them um, how much fun it can be, and show their parents how much their kids will enjoy it. I mean, at Camp Festival, it was absolutely packed constantly with children wanting to, first off, play Minecraft and then have a go at Scratch, um, and make LEDs blink and things like that. We have a wonderful community, and in that community, we've got lots of people that run these Raspberry Jams, which are sort of local events all over the country and all over the world now where, again, people can come along and try out the Raspberry Pi, and we spend a lot of time supporting them. Um, and we do some projects. So this is uh, Tim Peak, the astronaut Tim Peak, and he's holding in his hand an Astro Pi, which is a Raspberry Pi with a sense hat on it in a very expensive aluminium case. And there's two of those up on the International Space Station at the moment, um, and they're running code that is, at the moment, they're running code that was produced by children all over Europe as part of a competition we ran. Okay, so we allowed them to write some code, to run some experiments on the International Space Station, and then they can get that code back down, which, again, I think is a lot more exciting than making pixels dance about on the screen. And one of the other major things we do is we run these extracurricular activities. So Code Club is one of our largest, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end of the talk. Um, and again, just giving those children their first experience with um, code. We're very passionate about open source software at the foundation. Okay? So all our resources always use open source software. Um, and at the teacher training events that we run, I quite often have to explain to teachers what open source software is. You all are aware of what open source software is, and you're all aware of the benefits of open source software. But a lot of teachers aren't um, used to that. They're not used to the concept. They're used to paying for expensive licenses for the software they use. Uh, so we're very passionate about open source and about promoting open source. And we've helped fund, we helped fund this one, which was the Sonic Pi program to give children a chance to make music with code um, and things, various libraries that we do. So we've got a Python module called GPIO Zero that we produce. And the idea behind that is to, um, is to give children a zero boilerplate interface to using GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi so they can make LEDs blink and anything in a couple of lines of code without having to write huge amounts of code. But that passion for open source software follows over into open educational resources, which is a movement that started um, by UNESCO in about 2002. And the idea behind open educational resources and something that we're passionate about in terms of producing our resources is that we should, we should release resources to the community for people to learn on using the same sort of licenses that you're familiar with from open source. Okay, so um, in particular with open educational resources, we tend to use permissive Creative Commons licenses. And the idea is that we can produce resources, we can have them out there, people can use them freely, okay? Um, people can change them, alter them, improve them, do whatever they like with them. And again, this is something we tend to tend to try and explain to teachers on our, on our training is that um, they should try and engage with this idea of, of having open education resources, of make it, when they produce a resource, when they produce a lesson plan or a worksheet or an entire course of work, that it's going to benefit them, the whole teaching community, and more importantly, the children all over the world if they open source those resources. So we do that at the foundation. This is a snapshot from our... Um, 
slash learning page, so raspberrypi.org slash learning. And we've got lots of different resources up there, okay, that we produce all the time. And there's probably about 100 different resources that we've got up currently. We produce about one new one every week or two weeks. Um, <clears throat> and I'd just like to talk a little bit about the process about how we generate those resources, okay, and why we do it this way. So we're currently trialing a brand new system at the foundation. It's all really exciting for us to, in a new way of generating the resources, because the old way it was very, um, very tricky to use, and you had to be really familiar with Git and GitHub in order to be able to do it. It's a little bit more simplified now. So we have this lovely web app that our engineers have produced for us. Okay, and we've just got two entry fields on this web app. When I want to make a new resource, I just type in the name of the resource, so what it's going to be titled as, and then I give the repo a name. And when I hit go on that, a little bot runs off for me, and it goes on to GitHub, and it creates my GitHub resource for me. So it creates a repo for me with the correct name and a couple of branches in it, and I get a nice little link to that. And that means I can flip over onto the uh, GitHub website, and I can have a look at my new resource that's created. And it's on master at the moment, but we have uh, another version on draft, on a draft branch in there. And that contains all the boilerplate for our resources, all the basic markdown and all the stuff, all the YAML files. And I heard someone talking about YAML earlier, and I didn't realize it was out of fashion, but apparently it is. Okay? But we still use YAML. Um, and so we've got lots of YAML files in there and stuff like that to try and uh, structure uh, the resource a little bit. So once we've got our resource and, and we've done that, we can then start editing it. And again, if you look at my team, the education, not my team, my boss will kill me if she hears me say that, if we look at the education team, okay, we're all very different. So some of us like to use uh, Linux, some of us like to use Windows, some of us like to use Mac, some of us like to work on GitHub in a text editor, some like to use a GitHub app, whatever it is. So we all have our own different way of, um, of interacting with GitHub. So what we do is we clone that resource um, locally, and then we can just start writing our markdown. So this is some markdown for a resource I wrote on, no, I didn't write, my boss wrote on uh, making a whoopee cushion. So this is a digital whoopee cushion with a Raspberry Pi in it, and you can put it on a chair, and when somebody sits down on it, it plays rude sounds at them. Um, and it's all just fairly simple markdown that we write in, we try and keep it as close to standard markdown as possible. There's a few other little embellishments we have in there. Um, and then when we uh, commit to draft or commit to master, that resource is then published, um, either on staging or on our main website. And we've got some uh, Ruby scripts that does, uh, uses webhooks and some Ruby scripts to then generate our content, and we get our website produced. I must warn you at the moment that our, we're currently A-B testing between the different versions of our website, and they're not quite optimized yet. So looking at our resources at the moment, it's a bit hit and miss as to whether you get the new version or the old version. Um, but yeah, we have, this, we have this whole automated system. So at the end of the day, all the authors have to worry about is writing correct markdown. Once we write our markdown, it all just gets pushed up to our website and is available for kids and teachers to start using. And that's really important for us. It's really important because we're a really small team, the education team. Okay? There's only a handful of us working on this. In fact, there's only three of us whose full-time job is to make resources, and we have lots of other jobs to do as well. So there's only three of us that can make these resources, and we're not perfect. We make mistakes. You know, none of us are professional software developers. Some of us have got experience in, in playing with software and writing software. Some of us have computer science degrees. I don't. Okay, so sometimes I'm going to make a mistake in my code, or I'm not going to do it the perfect way. And it's at times like this that we start relying on our community a lot to help us out with our projects. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite all of you to become part of that community. Okay? I'd like to invite all of you to have a go at going onto our website, having a look at slash learning. If you've got a Pi, then you try out one of our Raspberry Pi projects. If you haven't, try out one of our um, cross-platform projects. But have a go, have a look at it, and go through it and think, ah, I could improve this, okay? or there's a mistake there, or that code could be written better. And then do what the rest of our community does at the moment. Okay? So quite often we get this. We get issues every day on the resources. It's a, it's a little bit of a pain when it happens, because it might be a resource that was written like a year and a half, two years ago, and I've completely forgotten about it. All right? But we'll get an issue posted by a member of our community. They'll have gone on, had a look at the resource, and gone, oh, this bit was a bit tricky for the kids to understand, or that code didn't work, okay? or you've got a typo here, 
And they'll, they'll submit an issue to us, and then we can go in and we can fix it. So we like it when we get issues. We like it even better when people have forked our repos and done the work for us, because we're fundamentally quite lazy. And what I'd much prefer to happen is if you spot a mistake, is for you to fix it. Send me the pull request. I can have a quick look at it. Send it off to our copy editors to make sure you haven't made any grammatical errors or anything like that. And then um, that can all be fixed. And as soon as I accept that pull request, it goes live. It's up on our website. We've got a resource um, that's been fixed by a member of the community. And that's really lovely when that happens. And we get pull requests quite frequently as well on a lot of our content that we do. Uh, and the other thing you can do, hands up if you've got a Raspberry Pi. Oh, awesome. All right, if you've made something that you think is quite cool on your Pi, if you've made just you know, a little script, you've done a bit of physical computing or not physical computing, you've done just some standard software development, and you think, actually, this would be quite good for like an A-level student to do, or this might be quite good for a seven-year-old to do, or maybe you've got kids and your kids are in a really cool scratch game, okay? or your little brother or little sister has made a really cool scratch game, and you think, oh, that would be really good for kids. Why don't you contribute to us and tell us about the resource? All you have to do is go onto our repos and have a look at the markdown and the way we structure our projects, and then you could turn that thing into an educational resource, and we get millions of hits on our website. Okay, we get millions of people looking at our resources. And your resource could then be used by people all over the world. So we're absolutely fantastic. This one is contributed by a very talented developer who's part of our community uh, called Martin O'Hallen. And he uh, worked with uh, some kids to produce a, um, an awesome Minecraft International Space Station. Okay? that when you took the data from what the International Space Station was doing from the sense hat, it rotated the International Space Station okay, in, in the sky in Minecraft, and it had bars and charts for the temperature and stuff like that. And he then turned it into a resource. So um, that's one thing I'd like you to do <laughs> for me. That's one thing I'd really, really appreciate if you could engage and have a look at our resources on GitHub and then maybe do some pull requests, issues, contribute. But there's some other stuff you could do to help. If you remember back at the beginning, I've said those teachers that aren't confident, and so therefore there's those kids that aren't getting the opportunity to learn about computing. Well, you can all try and give children the opportunity to learn more about computing and digital making if you've got a little bit of free time. So there's several ways you can, you can um, Devote a little bit of your time. So STEM ambassadors is a really cool one. STEM ambassadors go into schools all over the country and help um, workshops. Is there any STEM ambassadors here? Lovely. Brilliant. OK, so STEM ambassadors are absolutely awesome. We love them. But there are others as well. There's Coda Dojo and things like that, um, uh, working with children to help them learn all about computing and computer science. Um, there's co-clubs. Does anyone here run a co-club? Oh, brilliant. Your stars. Two Three, three people, brilliant. Uh, code Club, I said I'd talk about it a little bit more, is huge. There's like 8,000 code clubs all over the United Kingdom now. There's more, they were in um, 80 countries. The resources are published in 15 languages. And if you go into a code club and you watch the kids, how excited they get. This after-school club where they get to go in and they get to learn a little bit about computing. Uh, we do Scratch, HTML, CSS, and Python in code clubs. Um, all you need, really, if you want to get involved in doing a co-club, is you need to go onto our website, and you need to um, look up co-club. And any school that's requested a developer to volunteer, they can assign you to that school, to a local school. Okay? Um, don't worry. You're not going to be left on your own with a bunch of screaming children. Okay? You'll have a handful of kids, and the teacher will be in the room all the time to help you out and to help you with that classroom control aspect of it. Um, but then you can go and work with these children, and you can pass on your skills to these kids, and your enthusiasm, your love of code to these children. They can then write projects. They'll be happy. The world will be a better place. It's absolutely fantastic. And then perhaps you're not particularly fond of working with like really young children. So Co Club tends to be for about 8, 9, 10, 11 year olds. We've got a new project called Pioneers. This is for the slightly older children, the more independent children. Um, so Pioneers, the way this works is you, a group of kids will want someone to help them out. Again, you're not necessarily going to have to teach them or work with them hugely closely. You'll just be there to give them a little bit of advice and a little bit of help 
Um, and with the Pioneers program, we do about once a term, we release a new competition title. So our last one was Make Us Laugh. And we had all kinds of really cool projects, um, some of them that we weren't able to, um, they were a little bit too dangerous in their sense of humor. So we weren't able to um, show a lot of them. Um, but these kids enter this competition and they try and produce something with any bit of hardware or software they want uh, to win this competition. And they need, as well, help mentors, supporters to help them out. So that's uh, three ways I'd like you to think about maybe helping Raspberry Pi, okay? Um, and the foundation and our work to put digital making into the hands of children all over the world. Please, please, please go check out our resources on GitHub. Have a look, okay? Have a look, see if you can contribute, see if you can help us out with that. Run a co club, run a Pioneers, volunteer your time and uh, give those kids the opportunities that I'm prom sure a lot of you had. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. Um, and good afternoon. <laughs>